but like, okay. Look, you're not even at the back of the room. I'm starting anyways. Welcome to Introduction to Kernel Exploitation. Uh, it's a subsection of binary exploitation, which is finding bugs in compiled programs. I'm Zach Ecob. I didn't include a who am I, but I'm just a first year student, comp sci, don't have an internship. I know this is going to other companies outside, so feel free to give me an internship if you feel like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. All right, overview of the talk, uh, or what you can expect to be seeing, is we'll be running, like, what even is a kernel anyways? We'll be going what the threat model is. Alex already covered that, which is why you even want to hack this thing. We're we'll going through how you even interact with the kernel. Then we'll go through common methods of escalating privileges, and then some stack and heap exploitation techniques. You don't need to know what all those concepts mean yet, but you will soon. Also, side note, uh, this is targeted at Linux x86-64, which is a bunch of other buzzwords. Um, you don't need to know what that is, but it's pretty high level, I guess, abstract uh, talk, so it's not too implementation specific. Uh, should carry over to stuff like Mac or Windows and such. Anyways, what even is a kernel? A kernel, uh, when it boils down to it, is just a program. But it's a very big and very important program, and it acts as this interface between hardware, so like RAM, CPU, your hard drive, uh, and software. Uh, mainly because it abstracts hardware to user programs, because you just want your code to run. You don't need to worry about like, exactly what type of CPU uh, someone's computer is running it on. It also does other stuff uh, very fundamentally like scheduling, like your computer can only run maybe like four things at once, like simultaneously, but if you've ever looked at task monitor, there's like 100 programs seemingly, but they all seem to run at the same time. Or like, like I said, you actually need to go through the kernel if you actually want to read or write files. So a bunch of that really like fundamental stuff. Uh, final thing for this is it's pretty important to note is that the kernel is always in memory. It's always in RAM, uh, and it's pretty distinct from user space. The user space is in the bottom half, and the kernel space is in the top half, and the gap is there because we don't actually care about how much memory we have. Now, onto the threat model, or why we even want to hack this thing. Uh, mainly, it's going from an unprivileged user, if you're some random Joe on a computer, to being an admin who is cool and has privileges. Now, for privilege escalation in, I guess, like user programs, uh, not every user program can actually escalate your privileges. Like, if you think about it, you can't write some crappy program yourself, compile it, uh, and then exploit it to become an admin, like, obviously. But because the kernel is this, like, very fundamental low-level thing, it's the program which actually stops user programs from doing stuff they're not supposed to, but nothing stops the kernel. So any exploitable bug in the kernel is able to escalate your privileges, which makes it like very appealing for hackers and a very security critical thing. Now onto this mess of a slide. Um, this is how you're interacting with the kernel. Now the bottom bit, does my mouth show up? It does, amazing. The bottom bit is uh, C code, which is gross. But you can see these pretty roughly translate to system calls. And a system call is a little bit of a code that the kernel allows user programs to, I guess, run, because like I said, you need it for a lot of these important tasks, such as here, the system calls for opening, reading, and writing files. The other main important one uh, are device files, which, because Linux, everything is a file, often certain drivers will create a device file, which you can interact with, with file operations. The last thing is here for completeness, these are interrupts, and I think they're pretty interesting, um, but basically that's how hardware talks to the kernel as opposed to these two, which is how software talks to it. All right, now these are some technical terms. Uh, a process is just an instance of a program in memory, um, and it tracks which user started it, because uh, it's different if you're running RM as a normal user than as an admin. Uh, and how it tracks it are, you know, the process's credentials. And so when we talk about escalating privileges, that's mostly all about that credential structure. And we want to forge our process's credentials to be admin credentials. Uh, there are two main ways about, of going about this. 
Uh, number one is the kernel is very nice and just gives us functions to do it. So you see prepare kernel creds, you hand it zero, and you commit those credentials, and all of a sudden your process has admin credentials associated with it. Uh, and this is very good if you somehow manage to control uh, what the kernel is executing directly. Uh, the other main way we go about it is if we just read and read through like all of memory in your computer and we search for certain magic values, then once we find them, we know, oh, we found the credential structure, let's overwrite it to look like an admin's credentials. Uh, and this is good because sometimes you can arbitrarily read or write memory, but you don't actually directly control execution, so you can't call the functions above. Now about to head into stack exploitation concepts. These are the things you need to know. A stack is a section of memory, uh, and it mainly stores local variables. Sometimes arguments of functions, arguments also go into these things called registers. Uh, hopefully you know what a CPU is, but it's what executes your code on a very fundamental level. And registers are a small set of variables used by the CPU to execute code. Um, both of them are general purpose and used for anything, but two very important ones are the PC, which holds the next piece of code to execute, and the SP, which holds where the stack is in memory. Now, we're talking about like kernel exploitation. We're assuming this is a high level talk. We're not, we're not actually going to show um, genuine bugs because that's complicated and I would be talking for much too long. But we assume that you have this thing called a buffer overflow where you've got a buffer on the stack and you can write out of bounds. And the thing is, is that when a function is called, it has to know where to return to uh, in memory because functions are pretty modular and they be can be called from several places at once. You can't hard code that. And so it stores this uh, and it's called the saved PC. And it's stored on the stack. So if we can write out of bounds for our buffer, we can overwrite the saved PC. And then when the function returns, it sort of just blindly assumes that whatever is in that saved PC value is valid and it goes to execute that. So we overwrite that and we point some code to user memory. An important thing to know is because we're hacking the kernel, we control all of user memory. And then we can put some fake kernel code in user memory. You don't need to know what all this assembly is because assembly is terrible, but on here, if, cool. If you call back to how we escalate privileges, you might see the prepare kernel cred and then the commit creds. And this very loosely translates to these instructions. So if we control the saved PC and we point it here, we've got admin credentials. And it's really that simple. That is the rough sort of flow of a basic kernel exploit. And then you have admin privileges. Uh, the thing is, is that, like I said, the kernel's, I guess, very security critical and you don't want anyone to be able to just become a cool admin. So we have these protections, and one of the main ones is this uh, mouthful thing called SMEP, or Supervisor Mode Execution Prevention. Supervisor is the kernel. The idea is, uh, if you're executing code as, as the kernel, then the PC should have a point to user memory, which is why it's important that the user memory and the kernel memory have such a clean distinction, with the user memory being low, kernel being high. Uh, also, because we're hacking the kernel, if we mess up with the kernel, then your computer just crashes and it has to reboot, like it's not a clean thing. So it's important for your exploit to work. But also, uh, SMEP is, an, I guess, a complete protection and we can still freely read and write to user memory. Which is why I get to talk about return-oriented programming. Now, we can't execute code in user land, but we still assume we have control over that saved PC value and thus PC uh, sort of indirectly and we still assume we arbitrarily control the stack's contents. So ROP is this idea of we could uh, like execute code in user land, or we could just use a bunch of kernel code instead and just splice it together. And because we're technically never executing in user land, SMEP never gets triggered, we're happy, we end up as admin. Now very loosely, how this works, is that at each function it calls return and it pops PC. So if we have a normal stack, upon the epilogue it'll pop PC and go back to executing normally. But 
if we overflow a buffer, we don't need to care about what BP is, and then we overwrite save PC. We can call a function. When it returns, it will assume that the thing above it is where it's returning to. So you can sort of just chain functions together, which is pretty good, but not exactly what we want. We sort of got function granular control of execution, but what we do want is like, we want to execute only specific instructions. We don't want to execute an entire function all the time. So what people did is, well, you don't need to actually call a function. You can just call the very tail end of a function. So for this, for this example, if you wanted to set EAX to zero, which is just some random register, you would call uh, not main, but you'd call main plus 68, whatever address that translated to. Uh, and these are called ROP gadgets. And it essentially boils down to you do a very small operation on a register, and then you hand execution to the next address and stack. So often you'll like move values between registers, or zero out a register, or you know, pop a register, so move a value into it. And this is very loosely what um, a ROP chain looks like for the kernel. Once again, you can call back to, I guess, how our escalating privileges with prepare kernel cred, commit creds, and in between we have these ROP gadgets which will do a small instruction and then return. And it's important to note, like I said, this is just, cool, this is just uh, kernel code. These things aren't actually the assembly instructions. Uh, here, for example, this might just be an address in kernel, which will then go to execute. And then, very finally, is supervisor mode access prevention. Very similar to SMEP, but it's more hardcore. So it no longer lets us freely read or write uh, to user memory. Uh, you might be wondering how system calls do it then. They have to use special functions to accept and return user input. Um, and exploitation is pretty much the same. We still want to use a ROP chain, but we can no longer like, have the ROP chain in user memory and freely write to it. We have to put it somewhere in kernel memory which is much harder because we can't directly affect kernel memory as an unprivileged user. And we won't be going any further for that, for stack exploitation, that's, okay. That's stack exploitation, where I'm leaving it is, we usually want to overwrite this saved PC on the stack, which lets us control execution, and thus we want to call these nice uh, functions the kernel's given to us. And then the SMEP and SMAP protections usually mean instead of uh, put forging kind of code, we create a ROP chain and we direct execution to there. Next is this monstrosity of a diagram uh, because I'll be talking about heap exploitation. Heap is sort of similar to the stack. It's another section of memory. Here it's mainly used for, I guess, dynamic memory allocation for when you want memory during runtime. Uh, the user space has a normal heap, but the kernel has its own special heap. And you can see a normal kernel program usually makes requests via the kmalloc call, which, upon which it gets returned a thing called a chunk of memory. And then it hands back that same memory with a k-free call. Now, the way the heap knows what memory to give uh, upon being requested kmalloc, it keeps track of this thing called the free list, which is the list of free chunks. And also the free list head is uh, what chunk is going to be returned next. And it's pretty much just a linked list structure. Upon being given a chunk with k-free, uh, that chunk gets prepended at the start of the free list, and upon being allocated, uh, the chunk at the head is returned. Uh, this also makes the heap a last in, first out uh, structure, which is important to know when interacting with it. Uh, and before we get to the actual exploits, um, Kernel heap exploitation really hinges upon uh, what sort of structures you can actually get allocated onto the heap. And different structures end up having different use cases. The main ones are a function pointer, which is, well, a pointer to a function, uh, and then user controlled data, which usually the end goal is overwriting a function pointer uh, with user controlled data, and then when you call it, you're redirecting execution. Uh, and the kernel heap is actually pretty nice because there are so many of these structs as compared to, say, like a user heap exploit. Now, UAF slash double free, I believe a UAF has been uh, already slightly covered, but it's basically when you allocate memory from the heap, 
you free it, and then you use it again, but it's invalid because you freed it. And in between freeing it and using it again, uh, another program can allocate it for a different use. Whereas a double free ends up being pretty similar, but you just free the same memory twice, and it can be reallocated twice, uh, but using different structs. And so the least sort of plan we have is we want structure A to have a function pointer in it, structure B to have that user controlled data. Uh, one thing to note is that if you control a function pointer, it's not quite the same as having execution flow entirely. Uh, we can't move exploitation, like uh, execution to a ROP chain. We usually want to arbitrarily read or write memory, uh, which is why I included the second method of brute forcing memory to overwrite that credential structure. This is, I guess, very loosely what a UAF looks like. You don't need to know what these structures exactly return to, but these are real structures in kernel exploitation. This one is sequential operations, 32 bytes, and it has four function pointers in it. SEDEX ATA is made up entirely of user-controlled data. And if they're each pointing to their own chunk, you would be entirely fine and nothing would go wrong. The function pointers would be valid and the user data would just be sitting there doing nothing. But if we assume they're pointing at the same chunk of memory, then you can overwrite these function pointers with user-controlled data. And then next time they're called, you can essentially then start brute forcing through memory. And then we assume you overwrite the uh, credentials and you've become an admin. Uh, and then finally, uh, the heap buffer overflow is similar to a stack buffer overflow in which you've got a buffer on the heap and then you overwrite memory from one heap chunk to another. Uh, because it's overflowing, we assume you already have user memory in the first chunk and so we want to allocate a chunk of a function pointer uh, after it and then write into it and be happy. And the way to do it is actually a bit specific, but we assume you've got this nice free list. Then you allocate two chunks. Uh, these chunks are the ones with function pointers in them. You free one, and then you allocate the malicious, I guess, orange chunk, which will overflow into chunk two's function pointer and you've got sort of execution flow control. Uh, and that's it for heap exploits. Um, kernel heap exploits are, in my opinion, much nicer than user heap exploit equivalents. Um, and it's mostly about uh, what sort of structs you have access to and then getting them allocated. Uh, and then you use a bug, sort of like UAF, double free, or heap overflow. There are more, but they all tend to go into this same nice direction of overwriting a function pointer, which allows you to then start brute forcing memory. Uh, and that is the talk. Uh, yep, that uh, went through what the kernel is, <laughs> what the kernel is, why we want to hack it, um, how you interact with it, uh, how to then escalate privileges, the um, brute forcing memory and calling those functions, and then the sort of nice flow charts for heap and stack exploit pathways. So, don't let people talk, tell you that the kernel is scary. It's really not that bad. It's really, you've got these nice flow charts. Um, what's next? I was told these slides would be recorded slash freely available on the internet. Um, and this is not the final extent of kernel exploitation. Mainly, this GitHub link has literally, I think, everything on kernel exploitation. This is what I think is the best uh, a CTF write-up, because it's pretty different to go through uh, an actual exploit than hearing me talk to you about it. Uh, slides so should be available. You've got my mail or my Discord handle I made when I was 15. Uh, and that's the talk uh, for real this time. <laughs>